Hey, how's it going? Over the last month after mentioning it in a video, Kangaskhan has quickly became the most requested Pokemon on the channel, and I've been excited about doing this one for quite a while. Back in the day, or maybe even today, I bet if you polled a bunch of people about what Pokemon they thought of when you say Safari Zone, that this Pokemon would more than likely be named by like 90% of them. Kangaskhan overall is a very interesting Pokemon, all the way down to random theories that it was the original mother of Cubone and that's what led to the original Marowak but all of that is neither here nor there and we won't get into speculation on some theories on this channel today. In terms of a solo run and my tier list, Kangaskhan looks really good on paper. Its stats look great and its TM learn set is really solid but I am kind of worried about the battle against the rock solid Pokemon trainer but we'll just get into that when the footage actually starts. Now I'm going to keep this one short because I had some computer problems and this is my second time writing the entire script but before we begin i would like to say that i do solo runs fairly often and if that is of interest to you consider subscribing to the channel to be kept up to date likes and comments really help out small channels the most so if you're someone who just normally doesn't think about that sort of thing or maybe you never interact or maybe you just don't know what to say then i got you scroll down hit the like and just type in cubone's mum down below if you'd like to help me out in getting this video recommended to other like-minded people in the algorithm and i I would just really appreciate it a lot. So with that out of the way, just sit back, relax, grab yourself a sodi pop, and let's see what this kangaroo is all about. Like all my runs, I make Kangaskhan my starter via the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and I edit the save to make sure I have perfect IVs to keep the playing field level. Today's name for the video will be Mommy, and you just know someone out there probably wants Kangaskhan to step on them, and God help us all. Up front, there are two things to talk about with Kangaskhan. The first will affect us immediately, and that's the bad starting moves. Comet Punch is essentially just a better version of Barrage, and a lot of people consider Rage to be one of the worst moves in the entire game. These are the tools that we'll be utilizing to try to get past the rock solid Pokemon trainer today. The second thing is that Kangaskhan has a wonderful host of base stats, but look at that special. 40 is just pretty bad, and it's one of the weak points of the Pokemon. If you need a direct comparison to understand better, 40 is the same special stat that Zubat has, so things could be pretty dire, but we won't really know the full extent until we get later in the game. As for this early game, I did multiple runs mainly just to try to figure out out the start. Kangaskhan does have some beefy stats, so it is possible to get past the optional rival fight immediately so you, we won't have to backtrack any. It does take a couple of times because Sand Attack is just the world's most annoying move, but getting this one down on the second attempt is pretty impressive, but you really don't have good runs just by being able to beat regular trainers, so let's not celebrate anything just yet. Skipping ahead a little bit, and I had hoped it would be possible to do Brock at level 9, but it's just not in the cards. I have to battle the Light Years Junior Trainer here, and and that along with the other trainers will get us to level 10. I had to use some comet punches here and that's not really great but at this point I was pretty much determined to get Brock down without leveling up anymore. And let's just say that Brock is not consistent. It takes a ton of tries to get past this complete wall but that's alright since I do use in-game time for my metric. And if you were doing like a speed run using real life time then maybe you would probably want a few more levels but that is not an option for me because it would basically doom the run before it even got started. Comet Punch is what you need for Geodude. It's going to be resisting the normal moves anyway and that means I'm basically going to be doing the minimum damage so having a multi-hit move do very small damage but hitting two to five times means that in the long run it's just going to be much better for this situation. In my very first attempt Geodude just uses the most tackles I've ever seen it use in my entire life and that means by the time I make it to the Onyx I'm just so low that my death is imminent and I promptly have to reset. And just in case you were wondering, hey Matt what what if you just use Rage at the start, got all the attack boost, and then just swept through the battle? Would that work? Well, I got you. I've tested it. I tried it once, and let's just say that locking yourself into Rage really early in what might be the toughest battle in the entire run just isn't a smart decision. Rage is awful, and if you guys don't know about Rage, it's kind of a weird move. You use it once, and from then on out, you're basically locked into this 20 power base move until you faint or the battle is over for the most part. Each time you get hit by your opponent, you'll get an attack increase, and I probably made 
it sound better than it is, but it has 20 base power, guys. That's all you need to know. Comet Punch, my other multi-hit move that I have, has 18 base power by comparison, and Tackle has 35. Let's move on. So I spent a ton of resets and doing multiple runs trying to get that compromise of doability and a decent time, and I'm finally just going to cut a long story short here and cut out that 45 minutes of me messing around with this fight, and we're just going to take a look at the successful attempt. And here we're going to see a pretty much perfect Geodude attempt. I guess technically there could be a better, a more perfect version of this, but starting out with a 5 turn Comet Punch, and then getting a couple of crits after that, and having Geodude use Defense Curl a ton, means that I get it down and get through it while only losing 10 HP. Now this in itself was a miraculous attempt, and it would be very sad if the Onyx came in and ruined our entire day. And I won't leave any suspense, I already said it was going to be the successful attempt. Onyx goes for Screech a lot here, honestly the most I've ever seen it go for, and that's kind of both good and bad. It's great because it's not doing any damage to us, but it's also a little bit scary because with 6 stages of debuff defense, Bide suddenly becomes really scary. I start to get it really low, and then it finally goes for that Bide, and at that point I'm already locked into Rage. When it unleashes its energy, I'm a little bit surprised that it only does 12 points of damage, and I'm able to barely get by this one by the skin of my teeth. I would not recommend this battle at level 10, but we do get it done. I tried this one a lot at lower levels, at higher levels, and this was kind of, like I said earlier, the best compromise because when I'm headed towards Mount Moon and make my save, we are at 20 minutes of in-game time, and that's honestly pretty solid. I'm happy with that. The next segment's not really worth mentioning. It's very easy, and the one thing I'll go into is that in Mount Moon, Mega Punch is great. It's just a strong move in general, but it getting stabbed with Kangaskhan is a huge help. I can also learn Water Gun as well, and you might be wondering why I didn't get that. And I'm just going to reiterate one more time for you guys. Kangaskhan has the same special stat as Zubat, and it just would, really wouldn't help us out right now. In Cerulean, it's immediately time for rival number two. On the Pidgeotto, I have a very clean start. I take a quick attack, and then I hit back-to-back -back Mega Punches to make this battle much easier. And from there, it's kind of just clean-up duty. Mega Punch is a very powerful move on Kangaskhan this early in the game. And compared to our starting move set, this is going to allow me to get through this fight and be much faster going towards Bill's house. So that means we'll skip over it because it's not too interesting and instead we'll take a look at Misty which isn't really that interesting either and I immediately crit the star you just to get it out of the equation right from the start. The star me is the Pokemon we usually have to worry about. It's very strong but in this instant it just goes for a tackle, it gets an X defend and then it goes for a water gun that doesn't crit and all of that adds up to a very easy victory and we can just be on our merry way. Down at the SSN it's time for the runs huge power spot. Body Slam is just always strong, but on a Pokemon that has very high attack, high speed, and gets the same type attack bonus, this becomes one of the biggest power spikes possible for any Pokemon. It's going to be a glorious sight to see. We're going to be Body Slamming everything, and I'll also pick up the rare candy guarded by the gentleman, and we can just be on the way to rival number three. Here we get to see some foreshadowing how powerful we're just going to be in this mid game as we go towards it. I just can't stress enough, I can't put enough praise on how powerful Body Slam is specifically on a normal Pokemon, and it just destroys this fight like you would expect, and it's going to make things very easy, and I'm not complaining about that because we do have some time to make up for a slightly slower Brock start. After that, it's time for Lieutenant Surge, and the first two Pokemon just aren't worth mentioning. They are just fuel for the Body Slam machine, and they go down easy enough. I don't even heal for the fight because I'm not worried at all, and I want to save as much time as I can, even those few seconds I'm trying to save. The Raichu, however, could have been a problem. With only 40 special, Thunder Thunderbolt would have hurt a lot. It just goes for a growl, but by that point it's already taken too much damage and we keep cruising along. I do get access to Thunderbolt and you guys already know that when this move is available, its coverage is too valuable to pass up for the Elite Four if anything else. Rock Tunnel isn't that interesting, it's very easy, but I will just quickly show the self-destruct hiker in the background. Being double weak to water means that even a Pokemon with 7 special could shred through him and it's no exception here and we can just continue straight on to Celadon. Like I've been doing in most of my recent runs, I do skip over the Pokemart for now. To cut a long story short, I'm going for the best time possible, but I also want as much money as I can accrue through the next few segments of the game. Rocket Hideout, Pokemon Tower, and the Safari Zone all have valuable items like vitamins I don't care about, and things like nuggets, and if we just hold off now, I can afford more stuff later, and that'll make us stronger in the late game. I've been having a lot of success with this, and I didn't really want to just skim over it for new reviewers, but that's my strategy. I do take on the Rocket Hideout first, and there's not much
much to say about it. Bubble Beam is the kryptonite to the Giovanni fights, and he's extremely weak to it. You guys already know how that's gonna go. I just didn't want to deny anyone who wants to see who the superior mommy is here. Uh, it's a very rare Kangaskhan versus Kangaskhan showdown, and you guys are welcome. From there, I do something I rarely do. I almost always forget Erica, and on this run, I decide, hey, let's just go ahead and do it. It's sort of a neutral matchup, but I go into it missing health, and I have too much confidence, honestly. It's actually looking really good. I'm body slamming everything. I'm cruising through the battle, but then the vile plume crits me, and it brings me back down to reality. So from there, do I learn from my mistakes? Absolutely not. I go in at the same exact health. I play the same exact way because in my mind, what are the odds that vile plume's gonna crit two times in a row? And well, my very small sample size tells me that it's 0%, and I scoop up another badge to continue on in our journey. Next up is one of the easiest battles of basically every run that I do. I go back and forth in my head about skipping rival number four because streamlining and condensing my videos would really only be a positive thing for the channel, but I just really like showing the main battles. Comment below if you care about rival number four and if its exclusion from the video would make you sad. I'm interested to know. After that, I head towards Fuchsia, and this is unrelated, but I took a break while recording my footage, and when I started back, my video resolution changed, so I had to slightly mess with the overlay. You guys might not have even noticed it, but this video has been a little bit cursed. I lost my initial script, uh, the first time I recorded it messed up, and then now little things like this are happening. But I just thought I would share because if you notice the discrepancy between the overlay, that's why. I pick up a little more money as well as the final HMs of the run inside of Safari Zone and from there we can finally make our one visit to the Celadon Pokemon. The main TM to note here is Rock Slide. I also pick up Ice Beam just because I can. And with all of our money that we saved up, I'm able to grab 7 proteins to pump up my attack. After several tests, the special was just far too low to really help out and the run just felt better by increasing our strong suit more rather than our weakness. From there it's time to visit Silph Co. and the key thing of note here is that this is where I need to get Earthquake as well as the Rare Candy on the 10th floor, so I do just that. Although Koga would be extremely easy, it would be a time save if I just go ahead and take on rival number 5 right now, so I do learn Earthquake and let's just dive in. Pidgeot is up first, and I'm holding off on Rock Slide for now. Notice that I'm not using Thunderbolt, and that's just because it's really weak, our special is so bad, and Body Slam actually does more damage. What ends up happening is that I'm not full health, I didn't heal all the way, I can't one shot it, and then it crits on a quick attack and I'm starting to get really low and this attempt isn't looking really great from the start. Next up is Growlithe and it's just essentially a break in the action. It's a free win and if you are wondering why Earthquake is called Tombstoner, I mentioned in the Vulpix video but D's Master made me a mod that changes some things around if you're confused by that. Tombstoner brother, you know? Execute is on deck and Body Slam can't one shot it but it does just set up Reflect on its turn but it's taken far too much damage by that point and from there it's over. I used to get a lot of comments about how I used to be wrong about Reflect in the past, but if you still want to correct me, you can comment down below because it's always good for the algorithm. Up next is Alakazam, and I'm not quite fast enough yet, and it outspeeds me. It hits Confusion, and it does heavy damage, but I barely survive with 3 HP. A Body Slam is enough to take it out, and we can just move on. And at that point, I'm just too low. Unless the Blast Toys maybe missed a move and went for some withdrawals, I just can't win, and I do get taken out by a Bubble Beam. Obviously, the solution solution here is to actually heal back up to full and try again. Things are looking alright, but I do fail to knock out the Pidgeot with the second body slam, and from there, it decides just to be as annoying as possible, and I take two sand attacks, and I just start missing everything, and guys, I'm man enough to admit that right here I just rage reset because I value my mental health more than just clicking A and just hoping that my moves actually hit until I die. Sand attack can go fuck itself. On the next attempt, it does go a little better, but I do take a sand attack, so let's just pray that it doesn't really matter. Moving ahead to the Alakazam, it disables my body slam on turn one, because of course it does, and that means I skip my turn. It goes for a wasted recover, and I'm able to earthquake it for a one shot. I'm really healthy, but a one stage debuff to my accuracy going into the blast toys, maybe we can do it, who knows. And since body slam is disabled, I hit a pretty respectable earthquake, but after it does some withdrawals, and I do miss a turn, so then I swap to Thunderbolt, it's weak 
week. I did test out the damage of the moves in other runs, and this is kind of a quick peek to see how little damage it actually does here. Despite it being super effective, it's, it's not the worst, and I can slog through this one to eventually get it done, and I guess all things considered, it really wasn't that bad, and we can move on. From there, I'll be skipping over Giovanni number two, but I will show you guys the final Kangaskhan showdown, since it has weak special and I'm pretty much out of body slams. I just spam Thunderbolt here, and this is the last time that we'll see Giovanni's Kangaskhan because for no reason he just completely gets rid of it after this. When I'm out of Sylph, I head straight up to Sabrina because a nice physical attacker against her frail psychic types usually works out pretty well for me. I use an Aether on Body Slam and we just can dive straight into it. I go into this fight without healing and just like with Erica, I might be a little bit too confident guys. It turns out to not be an issue at the start because I both outspeed and the Body Slam can one shot Kadabra so that's a really great start. Mr. Mime also goes down to a single body slam and things are just looking good. Things go a little bit sideways on the Venomoth. A body slam just fails to knock it out and I take a stun spore in return. I do finish the job but I'm a little bit low and I'm paralyzed. Alakazam goes first and it goes for side wave. Normally this is one of the weakest moves in the entire game but it does get a good roll and it takes me to the brink of death but I do hang on. My turn actually gets skipped due to paralysis but thankfully it just goes for a recover. With a second chance at life I hit a body slam and it does really heavy damage but just like me the Alakazam barely hangs on. This triggers a retroactive hyper potion, it goes to full health and from there I get a very opportunistic crit on body slam to finish off and take the battle despite being at 5 HP. Hell bingus. The next few parts are really quick, they're really painless, very easy so let's just keep it moving rapid fire to Koga. I have earthquake and that's all you really need to know. It can one shot the two coughings but the muck and wheezing can take multiple. The muck poisons me but it really doesn't matter and overall I just smash through this fight and I take another badge and we get that sweet speed badge boost. Now I can take my weekly brisk swim down to Cinnabar. I'm trying to keep this run on track and after the bare minimum and a little bit of tombstoner brother it's on to Blaine. This fight is essentially a carbon copy of what we just seen from the Koga fight. Earthquake puts in some overtime here and it slices through this fight with heavy super effective damage once again and we don't really need to dwell on this this one for too long. Keeping it moving straight ahead to Giovanni and honestly this is why I hung on to Bubble Beam for so long. Earthquake is really good but since I'm not healing to save time I don't want to use another elixir and since Pokemon like Rhyhorn or Rhydon have such weak special it makes this fight a little bit smoother. This was a minor adjustment that I made from my other runs and I think it paid off pretty well in the end but that's pretty much the gym portion of the game down and now we can move on to where the Poke Boys become the Pokemon. On deck is rival number 6, but first it's time to get rid of Bubble Beam for Rock Slide, and with that, our moveset is pretty much finalized and we can just dive straight into the battle. Pidgeot is first, and notice that Rock Slide is great here, but unfortunately without Stab or anything like that, it's just not enough to one shot. I don't take any damage back, and I just finish it off on the next turn. Honestly, I think Body Slam still does more damage even at this point than Rock Slide. And from there, the next two Pokemon are very weak, they're just a blip on the radar to our path to victory. Victory. Rhyhorn is weak to Earthquake and I only have one use of it left and while it doesn't knock it out with one hit it's fine enough just to finish off with a body slam. Growlithe is third and it's just as weak and pathetic as it always is and it folds like a wet piece of paper there's no surprises here. Next up is Execute and I go for a rock slide here because either way it's going to take two moves. I do get poisoned but I finish it off with a body slam and then we can look at the Alakazam. It still outspeeds me but I can take a side beam very well and a follow up body slam can finish the job and now we can see that last Pokemon. And that's Blastoise. I start off with a Body Slam and I crit immediately to take it to half health. It goes for a withdrawal to increase its defense. So since it did that, I swap over to Thunderbolt. I get a second crit and just like that, it's another one shot victory and I'm feeling pretty good about the run at this point. Looking ahead at the league, I think I have a great moveset that gives me answers for pretty much most of the things I'm gonna face. And the fact that outside of maybe rival number five, I pretty much crushed this game so far pretty easy. My main concern is that if the 40 special is going to play a role, but we'll just have to see how it plays out. Before I start, I do use every single one of my 10 rare candies to be at my absolute strongest. Since I don't have any badge boosting moves and I don't need to manipulate my experience any, so let's just get straight to it. On Lorelei, I have two great answers here. Rock Slide is the first option since my attack is really good, and Thunderbolt is the backup in case I take some growls. On the Dugong, I let a Rock Slide rip, and when it one shots, I know how this battle is going to go from the 
there. And then it's just honestly a complete stomp of the match. I do use Thunderbolt on the very high defense Cloyster. I body slam the slow bro. And then I just toss out some rocks at the other members of the team. And this one goes incredibly well. And there's really not a reason for a deep dive here. And everyone can just say goodbye to Lorelai for the week because she's done. This one's very consistent, very easy. Last week, Bruno was a bit of a hero. He was the huge obstacle and he stopped Dialga's reign of terror. And once again, I'm weak to fighting this week. But this is the vanilla game, so I'm not worried at all. This isn't the ROM hack, the Sanqui tool. But he sends out an Onyx. It gets demolished by an Earthquake. And then he brings in the Hitmonchan. And honestly, counter is kind of a funny move. I always forget about it. It only works on fighting and normal moves. So if you know that, you can just avoid it. But let's say you were to use maybe like a heavy damage stab body slam and it doesn't knock it out. It's going to absolutely bend you over and obliterate you if you have a fighting weakness. And for the second week in a row, Bruno has notched another victory against me. And at this point, I'm just wondering, what does my life come to? Should I just quit the channel? Should I even do solo runs anymore? All jokes aside, the solution here is very simple. Just don't use a normal move and use Earthquake instead. From there, you can pretty much slice through the rest of his team. And it's not the most clean battle in the one I'm showing now, but it's not like it's a really hard obstacle like last week. And as long as you guys heed my warning about respecting the counter damage from Hitmonchan, this one is pretty consistent. And speaking of consistent, I have Earthquake and I'm fast as fuck, boy. This is the most deadly combination with dealing with Agatha and her annoying team of all poison type Pokemon despite her supposedly being the ghost type trainer. I'd go as far to say that this battle is unlosable and I would say that it's probably the easiest battle in the entire run and we can just really quickly move on. Now let's look at Lance and I'm actually going to do a pretty deep dive on this one. Sometimes I'll get questions like, hey man, Matt, why didn't you use this move here or this move on that Pokemon? And I would like to maybe explore that a little bit more, but let's focus on this first battle real quick. First up is Gyarados, and I have two super effective answers, and here we'll just take a look at Thunderbolt, and just notice how it doesn't one-shot despite it being double weak to it. That's a direct result of having poor special. Even if I were to use calciums earlier rather than proteins, I still think it would be a two-shot, but just keep this in mind as we move on. Next up is the two Dragonairs, and it's really unfortunate that Body Slam is just right outside of the range of being a consistent one-shot, and that means I'm going to take some extra damage here as a result. It's not not bad, but I thought some of you guys might be wondering about Ice Beam instead in this position, and just like with Gyarados, I want you to keep these attempts in mind. The Aerodactyl can also tank two Thunderbolts as well, not really a surprise. It does some decent damage since it outspeeds me, but I get a little lucky with the Paralysis, and that means since it's slower now, I can fire back to back Thunderbolts and finish off the job. Last up is Dragonite. I crit on the initial Body Slam, but it's not enough. It's just outside the range that triggers a Hyper Potion. Then it uses barrier and from there it takes quite a lot of moves to actually take it down but eventually I wrestle control of the match and I finish off the battle. Now really quick we're going to jump into an alternate timeline before I get any comments about why I didn't use rock slide on Gyarados or why didn't I use ice beam on the dragons and right here you can clearly see that rock slide pretty much does the same damage as thunderbolt and since thunderbolt has 100% accuracy compared to rock slide it's a pretty easy choice for me to use that here. Let's keep it moving in the alternate timeline and let's take a look at ice beam for the dragons just so I can kind of cover my basis but still comment anyway if you're going to ask about it. Comment ice beam with a question mark below for the algorithm. On the first dragonair I do one shot it but don't let that confuse you I crit that doesn't count. What you really need to look at for evidence is that on the second one it's really not even close to a one shot it does about 80% so it's going to take two to go down unless you crit and if that wasn't decisive evidence enough just look at this double weak dragon flying type pokemon easily tank the ice beam and that's honestly the most damning evidence and the biggest reason why ice beam just isn't needed in this run because special moves are just really weak on Kangaskhan. Now finally let's take it back to the current timeline and finally look at the champion fight and see how the last obstacle matches up to Kangaskhan. Pidgeot is first and we've seen on the previous attempts on the rivals that rock slide is not going to be a one shot. On its turn it does just go for whirlwind and I can just take it out in the next turn and this is kind of what we've expected from this part of the battle. Alakazam is now second. 
And finally, in these very late stages of the game, I can actually outspeed it for the first time, and that means that Body Slam does exactly what the good lord intended, and we can one-shot it and move on in the fight. Right on is next, and it's weak to Earthquake, so I oblige it with two straight Tombstoners to finish off the job, and it even gives me a badge boost with a Tail Whip to help me out going forward. Arcanine is next, and you know that this thick dog with a dumpy will be able to survive a move, but that triggers a retroactive full restore, and I take it out on the next turn, and things are looking honestly fantastic. This one is in the bag. Yet another thick Pokemon comes in, I hit it with a Body Slam, I paralyze it, and I get lucky because it skips its turn, I avoid any hypnosis or anything like that, and I finish it off with a second Body Slam. At this point, I'm full health, I have super effective moves, and there's absolutely nothing that the game can do to stop me. And here, we're gonna see one of the biggest examples of cheating by the AI in the history of Pokemon Red. It goes for a Blizzard, and at first I thought it was kinda weird because it's not super effective, but then when it used the second one, I was like, is he gonna just freeze me here? And that's exactly what happens. I get frozen, and without a doubt, the game absolutely cheated as hard as it possibly could here because it couldn't win. And this is how my very first reset of the Elite Four is gonna happen, guys. It's on the very final Pokemon. I'm full health. I have super effective answers. Honestly, I just thought this was a little bit funny. Uh, it does kind of suck I have to go through the entire Elite Four again, but I thought that this was worth keeping in. You've seen how the battle went. There's no need to go into another deep dive, so let's just hop straight back into the next time I make it to Blastoise. I actually took a little bit of damage this time, but it doesn't use Blizzard. And after I crit on the second Body Slam, I'm able to wrap up the run with a pretty impressive Elite Four run with only one reset. And that's it. Kangaskhan has done it. And it was a really solid run. Honestly, if this thing had like 75 special, we might have a top 3 Pokemon on our hands. Kangaskhan was really impressive after making it through Brock, but before we go any further, let's just see how it did. Kangaskhan finishes with a level of 62 and a final in-game time of 2 hours and 56 minutes. It wasn't exactly an elite level run, but a sub 3 hour run is always very solid. This puts it just outside of the top 10, but I had a lot of fun doing this. I expected Kangaskhan to be a pretty good run and that's exactly what I got. With a very poor special and a pretty rough time on Brock, you really can't hope for too much more than this. So let me know what you guys think. Feedback is always important and welcome and I just like interacting with you guys in general so feel free to ask me anything or share any problems you had or anything, really anything. As for next week, we'll be doing a Palkia run just because it has as much potential as Dialga did and I'm just interested to see that. Jinx or Kabuto or even maybe an Execute Egg run or all ideas that are coming up soon but let's not look that far ahead but that's pretty much all i have for you guys today as always if you make it this far i really appreciate you and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and remember to take care of yourself and i'll catch you guys on the next video bye